Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Edge. Um, you can now listen to us on all major podcast vendors uh, and watch us on YouTube. So you you have a choice. Um, very happy to say that I've got uh, or we've got a guest on today that I follow quite a lot on LinkedIn. Very valuable. Help me with personal branding. Help me kind of do the thing I've been doing over the last year. Uh, Lester Chung, it's great to have you on today. Um I'm going to ask the same question as I ask everyone on this podcast is really give us a bit of background about yourself. Talk a little bit about kind of your background, how you got into the industry, what you're doing, where you go and that kind of thing. Sure. Thank you. Firstly, thank you, Jay, John. Uh, always appreciate being invited to such events. Uh, never take it for granted because um, yeah, it's not every time you get uh, asked to speak uh, on a podcast or to, to talk about, items, agendas that you are passionate about. And thank you for providing uh, this platform for people to share to share their experience and thoughts. So a bit about myself. I am currently living in Toronto, Canada. Um, and I've been here for about five years. That's where I started my, I guess, corporate, corporate life. Um, because before that, I was in Singapore. I was a Navy, Naval officer back in Singapore. So in the Navy, I focused on, I specialize in training and simulation operations, uh, project management. So some of my highlights there were, uh, I ran the Naval War Gaming and Simulation Center, which, yeah, thankfully gave me a lot of direct experience of what I'm currently doing, which is uh, running a security exercise program in a financial institution. So... Yeah, it's a, it's been a great journey into cyber. Uh, it's an area which I will want to continue to grow in, and I think it's a just just gonna continue to be more important and uh, start to be part of our our day to day lives. Um, understanding cybersecurity, living it, and yeah, being proactive about it both in your personal as well as your professional life. I, I, we'll have to talk a little bit about Singapore at the end mm -hmm. because I, I've been to Singapore and, and I thought it was an amazing city. Um, but I guess, f firstly, let's kind of delve a little bit into crisis management. So there are so many opportunities in cyber and there are so many different roles. And, and I think it's evolved over a period of time and it's kind of evolved out of IT. And a bit like IT, when I, when I first joined, you were the kind of PC support person and that evolved into being able to do networking or being able to do storage or being able to do certain areas and cyber is a bit like that i mean cyber grew out of it it became infosec and now really it's become a much wider remit so really for the benefit of our listeners and if i'm honest a little bit of a benefit for me mm -hmm. what is crisis management what does it entail on a on a daily basis and how how like why does it benefit businesses what, what's it exist for yeah so I think if we peel down to go back to the basis of what, what is a crisis. So a crisis is it's a short, hopefully short. It's a period of time where it's in, intense difficulty, trouble, danger, um, usually with little or no warning. Um, and you would have, during that time of crisis, you would normally have to make difficult or important decisions in order to get out of it. So that's, that if that is crisis and then crisis management is really being methodical on how you can if possible predict that something will happen at least you get an indication of okay there are uh, things are boiling up slowly and you best envision what's going to happen but of course sometimes it just hits you in the face like in, in the last two three years um, I, I think we've been slapped many times, COVID, Russia, Ukraine, and it, it it really brings back the spotlight on crisis management, which is great for practitioners in this space. Um, so that's the, the, the predictive part and understanding how bad it can go, uh, how bad it can get. Then the other part is, how then do you prepare for that? So I think if you look at a crisis, it your work or the actions that you take go beyond your normal routine, your business as usual. That's, 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 that's the big change from 
of how crisis will impact your, your business, your day-to-day. -day. Um, and then how do you restore that normality through sound decision-making? So a crisis is a difficult period. Um, it's beyond your normal routine. And then how do you, as best as possible, predict it? If not, best prepare for it so that you can quickly uh, revert to normality. Can you give us some kind of example of, of crises mm -hmm. that you've dealt with? Crisis, crises? I'm not sure which is the correct English on that front. Um, but what, what kind of things have you seen and how have they been dealt with? Yeah, so I think the the last few years has been clear examples of how, how, how firms have to adapt to existential, existential crises which are way beyond our control. I think just look at COVID and uh, Russia, Ukraine, just this, this two examples. Uh, I think COVID, there have to be clear lines of communication about what's the latest protocol, who is responsible, what, who do we go into office, do we not go into office? And I think the early days were very confusing because people forgot how to deal with a pandemic. And that's the, I guess, the, the, the nature of, I don't know, I don't know what's, what's, What's with humans and uh, short-term memory? We always forget uh, how and what was the last time around. How did we deal with it? What were the considerations? So I think COVID was one uh, major event uh, that helped everyone re-look at their plans, dust off their old uh, pandemic plans, which they realize is not doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, so that's one. And I think the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, it uh, helped us look at worst case scenarios from a cyber perspective, um, look at the past few campaigns, whether intentional or not intentional, and how it impacted several companies. Um, that gives us a good opportunity to relook at our, not only capabilities, but our readiness. Because having capabilities is one thing and being ready and understanding how to maximize the tools that you have is a whole different gambit. And I think that's where crisis management comes into play. Um, being able to yeah, handle, and at the end of the day, you, you can spend millions on all your tools. But if you can't handle and respond adequately to an to a, a attack, then it's it's all gone to waste. It's, you know, there's no way you can you cannot stand in front of whoever you need to stand in front to and explain yeah i spent 50 million the last year like, yeah sure but no one cares and they, what they care is how you responded uh, when you were facing an attack and how you quickly recover so yeah i think the last few years have, there were many opportunities for us to demonstrate um, readiness and if not uh, prepare for what what's to come next there's so, part of sorry go on john yeah i was gonna say so you know large enterprises likely have a um a playbook for for crises they have roles and responsibilities uh and you know they can pull it out execute on it but smaller companies or mid-market companies uh not so much and um you know they're they're more focused on incident management and maybe even their incident management isn't as mature as it could be uh mm -hmm. all of that said what are some of the best practices that you could recommend for a company, you know, mid-market company that, um, you know, are, is looking to kind of upscale and given, you know, the situations that have gone on, the pandemic, um, what has gone on with Ukraine and, and cyber, uh, what would you recommend that they put into place just kind of at that bare minimum to get right? Uh, so if there is a crisis, existential crisis to them, they can react in the right way. Yeah. So great question because not everyone has millions and millions to spend on that. And I think the, I think that there's two two parts that uh, I would like to propose. I think one is getting understanding of the landscape threat intelligence. I think that's one that can be purchased and serviced to your specific sector. Um, that would give you the worst case scenario and, if possible, early warning to whatever is boiling up. So that's, that gives you your awareness piece. The next piece is, if you look at it from an exercise point of view, that would give you the quickest way to understand where your gaps are 
and what is the most important to your business. Sure, you can dive into a detailed business impact assessment, your identify your crown jewels and all, but let's quick and dirty get a Intel report or a vendor to tell you, okay, what, what has happened over the last six months, what, uh, what's what's happening under the, the covers, run an exercise, and everyone will realize that, okay, how unready you are to deal with something, that's where the priorities will start to, to surface of, okay, do we even know where our assets are? Um, do we even have a clear contact list of who we're on the call? Are we covered with insurance? Who's our legal go-to? All these questions will start to pop up and that would, I guess, I guess it gives you more sleepless nights rather than help at the start for sure. But there's, there's no point keeping your heads in the sand uh, in, in this era anymore. Yeah. I think one of the key things that I've I've seen in the past is we would sit down and we would come up with plans when I worked in the corporate world. And I remember starting at a new company and, and going through kind of incident response and, and talking about what we were going to do and if there was a critical problem. And the documentation I looked at was send an email to key people. Now, firstly, the key people weren't at the company anymore, so it had clearly not been updated on a regular basis. And I asked a question, and I think John's probably thinking the same question was, what happens when your email system's down? Then what? And there was no that th there was no consideration for that. And 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 I'm a firm believer that kind of practice, I won't say practice makes perfect, because I think practice gets you closer to being perfect. I don't know if perfect ever really exists. Mm -hmm. But if you don't adapt plans and look at different scenarios and practice them it doesn't matter what documentation you've put in place you, you're going to be running around all over the place and i remember the first ever time i did anything similar to this in that in that company nobody had a clue i mean the, the documentation to follow the process was on a file server that i'd shut off as part of the practice and i'm like does anyone have it on paper mm -hmm. like that should kind of be step number one and 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 i don't know about you john but IT people like to to be prepared. We 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 I think we live in a in a world where we don't particularly like change. And for me, a crisis is all the things we don't like. It's major change right at the time when we don't really want to do it. There's no planning. It just happens. And I guess the the question I've got for you is. How do you get people to think outside of the box? I mean, if you would have asked me a year before the pandemic about planning for a pandemic, I'd have had no idea. No, no, if somebody would have said to me, 95% of your workforce is going to need to work from home, how are you going to accommodate that? I would have not had a clue how to do it. And I'm pretty sure based on the experience we've had over the last three or so years, there were not many companies out there that had ever considered that possibility. So how do you consider that? I mean, obviously moving forward, everyone's probably got a pandemic plan, right? Because we've lived through it. But how do people plan for that unknown? Do you literally just cover as many bases as you can and then adapt that quite quite quickly? Or how do you, what do you recommend? So I think there are two ways to do it. One, like you said, there's no way you can see what's happening in the future, which is fine. It is good enough if you can answer the problems of the last year, honestly. And from a risk perspective, so always always lean heavily on your risk, risk team. Um, they are, that's their job, right? They're, they're there to, to look at worst case scenarios and where the biggest impacts are and work with them to devise, update your plans to best answer what they are seeing. So that's one. And then secondly, the, the process of planning itself will put you in a good position to handle whatever comes next. And 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 I, I don't know, I'm sure it's a military saying somewhere like once you prepare to plan, uh, the planning itself is more important than the plan because once on the D-Day, whatever, something goes wrong and everything goes uh, belly up and that's where the process of 
understanding what's important, understanding what the risks are, understanding what you can or cannot do, who, who is your who are your who are your best friends in times of need, um, whether internally or externally, all that would come to the table and for for whether we like it or not, everybody's gonna come clean slate, brainstorm, this is the problem. What can you bring to the table? How are we gonna make the best best sound decision moving forward? And, and I think that's the only way to handle something that no one can predict. So the and if we tie it back to crisis management best practices, I think this is having um crisis structures, whether it's clear forums of who is going to call into which forums, who has clear lines of uh, approval authorities for some certain certain actions that you can take. There's, we always tend to complicate things, but if we boil it down, there's only so many things you can do. Right? We, we talk about IT, you can shut off, you can migrate, you can shut down services, you can isolate, you can take, take away assets, but there's not a lot of things you can do, right? Yeah. We, 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 we've, we tend to paint this big rosy picture of the big bad wolf coming in and there's so many things that you want to do. No, no. there's only, I don't know, 10, 20 actions that you can actually physically do in order to slow down or prevent or remove access to a threat actor. There's only a few things. So if you have the time and space in peace to detail what is the prerequisites in order to do those actions, what are potential impacts, and who is approving certain actions. Because at the end of the day, everyone needs to cover their back. That's fine. But if you take the time in peace to map that out and to understand all, all these are your, your tools, um, your, your weapons, your essentially your yeah, your order of battle, what we call in the military. You you know you have X number of assets, they can your your tank can shoot, I don't know, 10 miles, your fighters can fly 400 not uh, miles. These are information that you cannot afford to find out during the heat of the battle. You need yeah. to have it, you need to have it pat down um, on the drawing board, war gamed, and say, okay, in order to shut down these services, I will need this team. This team will need to write this script. This script will take two hours to execute. This is the fallback plan. And this is the potential impacts. I will need to send out whatever customer comms before I execute on this because this will shut down services. Money will not flow. And therefore, this is the potential impacts. And map it all out. If possible, write it in as much detail as you can in your playbook for a certain action. And that would give you your arsenal of tools before or when you're in the heat of battle. And then it is a matter of uh, decision making rather than information gathering during a crisis call. So I, 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 one of the things that you've said that I'm going to pull out on is, and I agree mm -hmm. with you, is the benefit is in the planning and not necessarily in the plan. Because mm -hmm. if you've got everyone in a room and everyone's had a discussion and they've thought about it, then when that thing happens, you don't necessarily have to go back to the plan because you've thought about the plan and you've written it together. Mm -hmm. However, people move around in companies, leave companies, join companies. How do you get the people that were not necessarily part of the original plan to understand that plan because my experience is, is if you just give them a document and say read this mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily sink in and i know that like tabletop exercises and stuff like that you can do but is it worth re-evaluating the plan with new people and how often do you do it because we we know for a fact that cyber people move around all the time i think the life of a CISO is like two years and, and they're going to be quite critical um, in, in that kind of process. So how how have you seen it work? What's your experience been to kind of make sure that 
you're not going through a filing cabinet or looking for the plan and, and then trying to say, what does this line mean? What does that line mean? Because I've seen that where people have mm. read the document a year ago, then there's a problem. You've never looked at it again. And suddenly you're like, what does this mean? How do you make sure that everyone's involved and understands what it is and just not based on a piece of paper? Yeah. So I think we all can agree the annual refresh of your documents is not helping. That's agreed. <laughs> so yeah, I think that leads to my point of uh, like you mentioned, I think we can't go away with instilling um, the, the a cadence of exercise. Um, and firstly, you have your regular cadence of exercise, which hopefully catches someone falling off the falling off the, the chart and, and not being aware. So that's one. And second, having that sensitivity of, uh, I think I mentioned, there are four times where you should consider running an exercise. One, if there's significant leadership change or change to key personnel within your team. Um, that's a good time to pick out the plans. Do you even understand the plans? Let's quickly walk through. And it doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, half an hour drill. Like, okay, have a team meeting. Let's walk through the documentation of whatever, ransomware playbook. Let's look. Let's look. Start. If, if your team receives a ransom note, what are they going to do? Is this inbox that they send it to still valid? Are we still receiving tickets from it? Okay, fine. Half an hour, once a week, half an hour, once a month, half an hour even. I think that's an uh, important part. Second is when there is significant technology or tool change. That's another time that you should consider running exercises because um, Running an acceptance test for a new tool is not the same as utilizing the tool in a day-to-day -day or a, a incident scenario. Uh, I think we get confused with the tool. And many a times, um, so much time and money is spent in implementing it, but we never really, right, like we, we bought a Lotus, but we never drove it to its max, right? And and that's unfortunate because uh the the baby is waiting ready and waiting to go and it's never met its uh potential or when you had to um put down your foot on the pedal and you realize it's not going anywhere <laughs> so that could happen as well and yeah I think the two other times is. Uh, one is when there is a significant change in threat level. Um, understanding that something has changed in what the threat actors are doing. Uh, whether it's a new IOS, a new new TTP or a new strain. Not maybe, maybe not a new strain, but a new um, shift in how they exploit. And I think that's a time where Quickly pull everyone together in an exercise, review what's the latest uh, information that you have, uh, validate that your tools are signatures are updated, the parameters still make sense. Um, update everyone on what's the latest threat. Uh, because sometimes the the the, the teams that the cyber teams in itself, they are all so siloed. <laughs> they just do their own thing day to day. They forget that they have so many other friends in, in the same space. Uh, they don't talk to each other because uh, there's no need to talk to each other. And, and therefore, uh, having exercises like that uh, refreshes your plan, refreshes your knowledge of what is happening. Um, and quick, it's, a, yeah, it's a good good tool to quickly um, level up everyone and we'll put everyone on the same page and then move on from there and again it doesn't have to take much of your time it's not a 10 hour exercise just an hour half an hour refresh on uh, get your intel team to brief on what's happening get the, the the various owners of the different defensive tools to say that if this were to happen are we ready and that's it do you gotta, see, sorry, go sorry. on. Jump. I was going to transition a little bit. Um, you mentioned uh, Ukraine and, and some of the stuff mm -hmm. going on there. Pandemic is threats. Uh, you've worked, obviously, uh, in, in uh, maritime, uh, you know, exercises, mm -hmm. cyber exercises. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, when the war started, 
um, the first initial invasion, I was at a, at a conference here in Portland, a cybersecurity conference. There mm -hmm. was a lot of talk about get ready, get ready. Mm -hmm. that, that Pearl Harbor event that we've been talking about is going to happen. Uh, the, the, the Russians are very good at cyber, very adept. When they attacked Ukraine after you know their freedom revolution, uh, they basically took down the country. They shut down the power systems, the banks, all of these things. Um, but we haven't seen that uh, level on uh, international scale. So you know we haven't seen the the type of attacks that we might have expected against uh, NATO, the United States, uh, the countries supporting Ukraine. Um, any thoughts on on why we haven't seen that threat level yet? Or should we expect to see it in the future as, you know, things start to heat up here and the so-called spring offensive that we're looking, you know, out to see uh, coming up with Ukraine? I think it's almost like a Mexican standoff or a Cuba missile crisis um, that, yeah, it's a, what do they call that? What's that term? That Mutual, uh, mutually assured destruction yeah, or mad that, as, as we talked yeah, yeah. a lot about in the Cold War. Yeah, that's right. And I think it is, yeah, it's more of a um, calculated risk. And I, I think it's too much of a, you can't really pull back once that happens. And right. and, and I think there is also perhaps no appetite to go down that far at this point in time. And just over this couple of months, things are looking that there's a new world order shift, right? There's no need to be too drastic in whatever they are they are needing to do, because um, there are other friends that they can rely on. So it's it's more 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 cons than pros. So why why would he do it? anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Let let's you hope think... it stays that way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Do you, are there other threats out there? Ransomware is one we talk about a lot on the show. Uh, it seems to to be persistent uh, as, as kind of the top risk to organizations. Um, as somebody well-versed in the threat landscape, what are you seeing other things other than ran ransomware? Is there something on the forefront that we should be concerned about in terms of you know risk for a company? Um, I think sporadic DDoS has been popping up uh, over, over the last couple of months as well. Um, and, but, so far, I think thankfully not too much operational damage. It's more reputational, um, more damage to reputation rather than than real uh, day to day uh, processing. So yeah, I think DDoS has. But I think the the tools have also uh, been refreshed. So not maybe that led that leads to not much operational impacts. Right? So we we've been able to to. Not we, I mean, we generally have been able to defend uh, against those uh, much better. I, I want to go back a little bit and ask about how mm -hmm. often, and I know I've kind of asked this, but do you think that tabletop exercises and, and stuff like that should be done in an organized fashion? Or do you see the benefit of doing them like as a surprise? as best you can and what what i mean by that is without telling everybody involved because i've seen both mm -hmm. and i know i have a preference and i think i know which one i find more useful but mm -hmm. what what do you recommend i think it, it all both both have their benefits or objectives they, they answer different things one answers readiness one answers uh, thoroughness of plans um and yeah i think you certainly can 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 use both in your arsenal is that at the end of the day all these are tools within uh the preparation of we're all trying to get ready that, that's all we're trying to do uh, and and that's the 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 danger therein lies if you do not understand the impacts or potential outcomes of executing certain exercises is that you may demoralize the team, you may confuse the team, and they some teams may never recover. And 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 that's therefore understanding the maturity of whether it's people process technology, understanding where a, uh where a cyber response team, where the larger, larger response team, whether it's technology, legal comms. 
um, line of business, how mature they are in understanding what they need to do in response, that would give you a good indication of how far of a lever you can pull. Yeah. Because, because some teams have no idea what a tabletop exercise is. Because that's in, 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 in the corporate world, it's when you say exercise, when I mention to people, yeah, I run exercise and drills. Oh, you mean fire drills? I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, we, we need to start somewhere. Um, way, way baby steps to to even understand that they need to transfix their minds in a hypothetical situation and actually think and do certain things and not just talk about it. Some people doing tabletop exercises just talk and talk hypothetically. And sure, that will not save your behind in a real incident. So stop doing that. Just look at a real incident. What can your team actually do if this were to happen tomorrow? Because touch wood, it can happen tomorrow. There's no time for hypotheticals. We, we, when we call to a crisis meeting, um, your CEO does not want to listen to your ideals. It's just, there's no time for it. He needs to know what's the facts. Tell him what you can do, what you know, what you do not know, and what you think is happening. But we can't go away with yeah, an, an, an ideal discussion about, yeah, if I had the time, I would do this. If I had the tools, if we bought the... <laughs> No one has time for that. So, um... yeah, I, I think both me and John have worked in the industry to have gone through a number of exercises as well as, unfortunately, I've gone through some actual incidents. I mean, I've had issues where large data centers have, have dropped off the planet for whatever reason. <laughs> um, I've lived through, unfortunately, ransomware attacks, although touch wood, not that bad. Um, and the And the team were very much like, deer in the headlights and, and and pre those incidents i struggled to get any real funding to do anything mm. and although we would practice exercises without any real funding it was hard to to do proper practice um but after we had quite a critical incident suddenly there was money and suddenly we, we, we could practice so we all sat down in a room and we come up with a number of kind of playbooks Mm -hmm. um, one of them was ransomware and then about four or five months after coming up with the playbook we ran a test and we didn't we didn't involve anyone externally and we just did it internally we convinced some senior management to report certain things make phone calls report certain things say their machines were behaving in a certain way and run it through as if they've got ransomware mm -hmm. um and actually, it was dealt with very, very well. But even though it was dealt with very, very well, we still tuned the plan because there were certain people that were called at the time that weren't involved in the initial plan. And um, we needed people on premise. We had some managed data centers and we didn't know the number to get somebody in that data center to go in and do certain things because historically somebody just drove there. And there were certain things that we we learned. So I, I I've definitely learned. Unfortunately, I think the hard way. Um, but John, before we pivot on to kind of LinkedIn and branding and networking, is there anything you want to add on on this kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, the one of the best uh, you know crisis management uh, tabletop exercises we did was on ransomware, and uh, we brought in somebody from the outside. Uh, they did basically ran a you know a thirty to forty minute exercise. And it was basically choose your own adventure, meaning uh, here's the scenario, here's the situation, you have two choices, it's either A or B. And then depending on what choice you made, say it's B, uh, then you were co confronted with two more choices. Uh, I found it very useful because it um, really narrowed down uh, the, the challenge and, and didn't get into that decision crisis uh, situation that you mentioned earlier. Um, have you seen where uh, you know people listening to the podcast could go? Is is there any websites or resources that they could leverage to you know, easily bring that into the organization without you know almost off the shelf sort of scenario without having to kind of recreate something? Or 
is there a, a a company or a third party that you would recommend that they engage with to you know get going on this because these things are are very critical uh we learned a lot from um you running these scenarios uh, the debriefs that we did, um, just, you know, it was like on a whiteboard and which is listing out all the things, you know, we needed to improve or consider, uh, evaluate given the scenario. Yeah, I think that's certainly, I'll, I'll give you three resources, which um, is, you know, it's all free resources and it's a good place for, for small, medium companies to start. So once uh, go to CSAR's website, uh, CSAR has, um, I can't remember, six, five, six, uh, examples of tabletop exercise scenarios, questions that uh, you can walk your team through. Uh, you can go to UK NCSC. I think they have an exercise in the box uh, package that uh, companies can use. Um, and the third one, just ask chat GPT. He'll give you a brief. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. He'll, he'll, he'll give you he, she, it would give you a fairly yeah, I mean, you can then fine tune to, it will give you a good frame base of uh, questions, considerations, and then you you can um, talk to your, your SME teams and sort of make edits on that. Um, and you can go from there. Yeah, so I think those are three, three, three ways to start thinking about it, start thinking, exploring um, yeah, exercises. Like I was... Like I mentioned, I was at a conference yesterday, keynote speaker, Kevin Mendian from uh, Mendian Google Cloud. Yeah, I, I only heard one thing when throughout his whole keynote, his, his whole keynote, it's like, do your exercises, do your tabletop exercises. Um, the two hours is well spent and we, we, we just can't ignore the threat anymore when a big company, small company, take the time, walk through a scenario, be frank about who's going to do what. Are we, do we even have capability? Who's going to call? Who's going to call 911? Who's going to call? Whoever, right? And, and if you don't do that, you assume that Bob is going to call him and Bob's not around. So who's, who's picking up his slack? So yeah, I think everyone should start looking at it. Not don't have to go crazy. Don't be like the military. The military, all, all, all we do all day is just run exercises. If we're not on operations, we're in exercises. No, no one is asking you to, to be like that. But uh, take the time, two hours, walk through your most, most senior of uh, leaders, um, make them understand the difficult questions that you are going to ask of them in such situations. Um, yeah, so let, let them sweat in a nice cold room before uh, an actual day of uh, heat. I've used the NCSC tabletop mm -hmm. exercise and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think they're pretty good. I mm -hmm. can vouch for them. Um, but let, let's pivot a little bit. Um, you're very, very active on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. You've been very helpful to me and trying to kind of get my brand out there and you've helped us with the SSC Forum podcast and you helped me with my posts. Um why why did you do it? What do you see the benefit in that? And why is it something that you're passionate about? Yeah. So I have only been active on LinkedIn for a year, just one year. Um, before that, I had a profile. I got a job. I ignored it. That's like everyone on LinkedIn. Um, but I think the 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 Hail Mary moment was when I was Realizing that, okay, even if I was excellent at my job and my current, my, my role touched a lot of teams and departments, right? Because you want to run an exercise, a uh, ransomware exercise, you need to talk to legal, comms, business, technology, security. Yeah. I, I, I already talked to a lot of people. But I was thinking, okay, how many people is going to know how good am I at my job? I was counting... Uh, I'm in a huge enterprise, but I was counting, okay, maybe 40, 50, if I'm lucky, 80 people is going to know what I do. And so that's one part. And then the second part is like, how many hours do we spend? Just one example. How many hours do we pour into creating one PowerPoint deck, right? 
your boss looks at it for five minutes and says, ah, take, out, take this out, take that out, delete, okay, put all the rest in reference, let's just show these two pages. I'm like, what the... <laughs> I, just, I just wasted 20 hours of my life doing research and and, and designing the dumb slides. Um, and you spend five minutes and we're going to show his boss two slides. That really no, it made, made me... It, it, it didn't make me question what was I doing, but it made me think about, I've already put in so much work and effort. How then do I, for lack of a better word, repurpose it to demonstrate certain level of uh, knowledge, wisdom, critical thinking that is, is really what I do, just that nobody knows. Yep. And, and therefore, personal branding to me I think it, it has a, a bit of a negative connotation uh, because uh, I don't know people I mean do you get do you get positive vibes when people start talking about it I think maybe starting but in the last 10 years people are like oh why why no no one shouldn't do that you're just talking about yourself yeah. you're just just bragging it's a fake facade blah 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 but no I think if you if you look at it personal branding to me is just taking whatever you're already doing at work and desensitize it, obviously, uh, remove whatever propriety information, keep it generic and in and, and, and relevance and just using it to showcase your experience, your expertise and, and the wisdom and all the effort that you have put into your work. Um, but, but you show it to a larger group of people. And I think especially LinkedIn has accelerated that for a lot of professionals. Um, previously, we have to go shake hands and kiss babies everywhere. Um, and even if you shake hands and kiss babies, you'll be like, okay, I, 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 I don't remember 80% of the people I just met. There's no platform to showcase unless you're standing on the stage. Fine, that, that still exists. But I think LinkedIn has shaken things up uh, tremendously where everyone who has a story to tell and if he is gifted enough in the art of storytelling can then uh, help broadcast his story to a, a larger audience. I, I think it's definitely, for me, mm -hmm. it's enabled me to share content that I'm passionate about in the, in the aim that it could possibly help somebody else and whether it just puts a smile on their face mm -hmm. or whether it's something that they can repurpose or whether it's something that helps them think that particular day in a positive way or helps them in their role that's the way i see it and for me i've always done face-to-face -face networking events i know that john has i've been to conferences and i've tried to network physically with people and a lot of the decisions i've made throughout my life both private and in my career have been influenced by things that other people have said and I've heard. So for me, it gives me a wider audience. Now, as my following is growing, I'm definitely getting more negativity. I wouldn't say necessarily more overall. I would just say the percentage is the same, but obviously I've got a bigger following, so it feels like more. I'm definitely getting a group of people that and I'm going to try and be polite about this, but just want help without giving anything. So mm -hmm. quite often it'll be, I want this, I want this, I want this, but there, there's nothing in return. So I think that's quite critical that it should be an exchange of information. And it's not always going to be that way. I don't put things in and I don't do the effort. And I know that you don't either just to get things out in return, yeah. but it, it has to inevitably happen in such a way that if you put in effort there is something coming back i mean i i've no issue with helping people with resumes or giving them advice um if they ask in a polite way because at mm -hmm. some point i'm going to ask other people and john i don't know if you want to add anything to that before we kind of get onto a few fun questions yeah i, I look at it as a, a town square um and, you know to your point exchange of ideas um hopefully you know bringing people together uh it for me, it's been multidimensional. Not only do I talk about security and networking, um, but we've had great conversations with Kevin Apollo on, you know, culture, uh, you know, some things to look at when you interview. 
uh, it's just all across the dimensions. And there's a lot of great people out there. And in the past, you wouldn't get to meet them. Uh, you know, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Um, we've got people, we're having conversations with people all across the planet. Uh, and that's, I think, the power of the platform is uh, you're just not local. It's you can go global if you want to and you can have conversations that are meaningful. Uh, but, you know, you're also to your point, Jay, you're also going to get the people that want to sell you something or, uh, you know, are reaching out with in a, in a transactional way. And that's fine. That's just the way the human being is. Uh, people got to make money. But um, I view it as a town square exchange of ideas and uh, getting perspectives that you wouldn't otherwise. So it's it's a benefit. So on to the first fun question, because I've looked at the clock and the time's ticking really sure, quick, sure, which sure. which just goes to show how great a conversation we've had. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about food. I mean, I know you said you were from Singapore. Mm-hmm. Now you live in Toronto. Um, what has been your best, best food experience? Now, it doesn't have to be the meal was fantastic, but it's mm-hmm. more a case of the experience. And one of mine, funnily enough, is in the night market in Singapore. Um, but what has been your best food kind of experience? I think Singapore has so much food. And to, to name one, it will be unjust unjust for all of them. I'll tell you about my worst food experience. Okay. So so I spent I spent six weeks on a German Navy training sail ship uh, when I was back in the Navy. And my gosh, the breakfast was same as dinner, which is bread and cold fish in a can. I was coming from Singapore. I was like, I, I don't know if I'll survive this six weeks here <laughs> granted the you 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 can get you can buy two cans of beer a day i think that's how they survive but besides that the, the only one meal they had was lunch and breakfast was exact same thing they had for dinner sardines i don't know what other fish they put in in a can but whatever it's like free for all open all the cans you want no thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's a yeah. good one okay john over to you yeah, I'm gonna um I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna ask a selfish question. So mm-hmm. um I do have trips coming up in the next month to both Singapore mm-hmm. and Toronto. Um mm-hmm. what uh what is the must eat items uh you know in Singapore and then also in Toronto? What must I have in order to to really enjoy the local cuisine? Singapore, I think you have to try the chili crab. Mm, chili I've crab. Heard. Yeah, chili crab, um chicken rice, which is yeah i think those those two um toronto has so much food i don't know i think mexican food is pretty good here somehow really so, yeah okay so i think mexican food yeah so i'm glad i'm glad you didn't say poutine oh no <laughs> <laughs> not 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 far east enough <laughs> no i i enjoyed my mexican food john when i was in toronto it was good mm-hmm. so yeah so all right Lester, I really want to thank you for coming on. Um, it's great. I, I always love when I look down at the clock and have a bit of a panic that the time's almost gone. That just shows that we, we've had a good conversation. Crisis management isn't something we've talked about before on the show. I think it is a topic that people will be very interested in listening to. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I think it was valuable. Um, so, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, John. Uh, again, uh, I don't take this for granted. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to talk about what I'm interested or passionate about uh, on your platform. And yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll pass across again. It's a small world. I'm sure we would uh, meet one day. And thank you so much, John. Safe travels as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.